Sabbath peace. Sabbath. It's another opportunity for us to come together and hear and learn of the word of truth as given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Son, through the, to the Father, through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast, and given freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe. In this state, you should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything that you do give, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that couldn't make it. Excuse me, but no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. Let's open up to uh, John chapter 7, verse 14. It's John chapter 7, verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Yahushua went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? All right, so they asked the question. They want to know, how in the world this man knows some letters? He ain't never learned the letters. All right, when it's talking about letters, it's talking about the scripture. It's talking about what we call the Old Testament. All right, they want to understand, how do you know the Old Testament? Right, for them, it's just the scripture, right? So how do you know the scripture if you've never learned? All right, let's hear about it. Yahshua answered them and said, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. All right, he said, no, it's not my doctrine. The stuff I'm teaching y'all is not my teaching, but it's the one who sent me. All right, what else he said? If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. All right, he said, somebody... <laughs> Y'all decide to do his will, then you'll know who doctrine it is. You'll know if I'm just running my darn mouth, or you'll know if it comes from the Father. Right? It all comes down to doing his will. But to do his will, you got to know the doctrine. You got to hear the doctrine. Right? You got you to be able to look, and you have to be familiar with the Scripture. All right? But that's the same thing that we've been taught to throw away. Talking about it's done away with. Right? We were talking about it last night. You know, you have a, a section of people, you have the Christians that that believe that the, the, the Old Testament or the law or, you know what I'm saying, all that stuff is done away with. And you got a section of people that's, that's, you know what I'm saying, that's all it's about. That's the only thing that matters. Nothing else matters. Yeah, it's a whole book that the Most High God gave us, a whole revelation that he gave us. The Most High God already told us. He said anything that's revealed is for us and our children. He said the secret thing belongs to him. This stuff ain't secret. He told Paul, he said this thing wasn't, Paul told us, he said this thing wasn't done in a corner. Right? That's what he said in the book. When he was talking about Yahweh, he was like, this thing wasn't done in no corner. You know what I'm saying? He said, everybody, this thing was put on display for the whole world to see about it. Book told us, and Yahweh, he said, go out and preach to the whole world. He said, to every creature. Right? So when we look at it, we have to make sure that we put it in the perspective that is necessary. Because otherwise, we won't understand the doctrine. We won't understand what we're doing. They throw this stuff away. How you think Yahweh can just come? He just thought, I'm only going to use the Old Testament. You know what I'm saying? I'm only using stuff that's revealed in the Old Testament. No, when he came, he had to make sure that he revealed, he created the New Testament. He revealed additional information. It was stuff that people didn't know, had no idea about until he opened up his darn mouth. Right? And he can't come and say, man, I'm only going to tell y'all some new stuff. No, when he come around, he's going to tell you, no, what, what did Moses say? He took, grab, uh, grab Matthew chapter 13. Let's see what y'all should, let's see, I mean, let's just see how he feel about this stuff. Because we talk about revelation and all this stuff, the reason why a lot of people don't get revelations, the reason why it's scary to everybody, because it's all new to them. shouldn't be new to them. It should be old. Some, when you read Revelation, even though it's a re revelation, when you read it, a lot of that should be old to you. You should be, oh, yeah, I remember that. Right? You should be, first time you read Revelation, you should be able to say, oh, yeah, I remember that. That's how Revelation is designed. That's how it's written. It's written. It's not written with brand new information. It's written with old information, with new information put around it. All right? Keep going. Or right, uh, grab, uh, grab, uh, grab Matthew chapter 13. Give me verse 51. Yahshua said unto them, have ye understood all these things? Yahshua asked him a question. He said, have y'all understood these things? He said, man, this stuff that I'm teaching you is not my doctrine. It's the doctrine of the one who sent me. So did y'all understand these things? And what they say? No. They said unto him, yes, Lord. Right? They said, yes, master. Of course he understood it. 
Right? Now watch how he explained what he's about to say. It's a man of God. Then said he unto them, Therefore every scribe which is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder. So understand what he said. Every scribe, right? Culturally, a scribe for us would be somebody who is an expert in what we would now consider the Old Testament, right? So an expert in the scriptures. So they're saying every scribe, every expert in the Old Testament who's instructed to what? Who is instructed unto the kingdom of heaven is like... So uh, being instructed unto the kingdom of heaven, that's talking about New Testament. So basically what he's saying, everybody who's an expert in the Old Testament and is well-versed and instructed for the New Testament is like what? It's like unto a man that is a householder. He's a house. It's like somebody who owns a house. And what do he do with it all? Which brings forth out of his out of his treasure things new and old. He said it's like somebody who has a house and he has a he has a place where he keeps his treasure. And when he brings something out of there, he brings new stuff and he brings old stuff. Right? What he's trying to let us know is to be able to be well versed in this thing, you gotta know the old and the new. You can't just come here with new. You can't just come here with, oh, you have to be able to put it all together. It has to be solid. Otherwise, you're not going to get it. That's why a lot of these Christians, it's a lot of stuff they will never understand. A lot of these Hebrew Israelites, it's a lot of stuff they'll never understand. Because it's difficult for them. We've been, we've been set up, with, they, call it, they call the word a dichotomy. A dichotomy is like when, when you got two sides, you know what I'm saying, where you got to choose between two sides. And trying to make them coexist. And try to, and try to no, nah, you try to make one go away. You know what I'm saying? Pretty much. In your mind, this is the one that's valid. The other one's invalid, right? So they set you up where it's at variance with one another. But the book wasn't made. Like, the book was made to be one book, solid. You know what I'm saying? So when you're looking at it, and they like, man, well, I'm a New Testament creature. And when New Testament creature to you means that I don't need the Old Testament, or the Old Testament is irrelevant, or the Old Testament don't apply to my life, or the Old Testament, if you keep it, then you, you don't trust the grace of God when it's, when it's set up that way then it sets you up for failure, right? We look at it in Sunday school, what they tell you. You know what I'm saying? We went to Sunday school. What, what was one of the songs that we used to sing? I don't know about y'all Sunday school. You know what I'm saying? What was the song that y'all used to sing in Sunday school? I don't know, Father Abraham and many sons. Father Abraham? Well, what do you know? I used to sing the same one. <laughs> Father Abraham had many sons. Yeah. Had many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. Woo-hoo. I, uh, 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 I don't remember the rest. So you know what I'm saying? Praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Right on, left on, left. Uh. Right. Adam's out there looking like idiot, just in there jumping around. Father, what right arm, left arm got to do a darn Father Abraham? Right? But they said Father Abraham. Let's see what Father Abraham got to say. This is Luke chapter 16. Whole book will make a fool out of these people. They respect Father Abraham. They like what he's talking about, right? Mm. Let's see. It's Yahushua telling us what Father Abraham got to say. This is Luke chapter 16, verse 29. It was a good song, though. They didn't even know what they were talking about. <laughs> we is the seed of Abraham. Verse what? This is uh, verse 29. It's Luke chapter 16, verse 29. It's Yahushua talking. He's telling us the story. And Abraham, Father Abraham, is involved with it. Watch what he's talking about. It's Yahushua talking, though. Abraham said unto him. So now this is Yahushua telling us that Abraham said unto somebody. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear that him let them hear them. He said, This is Father Abraham telling us that the people have Moses and the prophets. Well, you know it's another word for Moses and the prophets? The scripture. You know it's another word for the scripture? Old Testament. So he's telling them they have the Old Testament. Let them hear the Old Testament. Right? Don't go trying to save nobody. Just let them pay attention to the Old Testament. This is the advice of Father Abraham, who had many sons, and I am one of them. Right? Let's hear him. And he said, and he said, and he said, nay, Father Abraham. Right? So this is, uh, this is, uh, Lazarus. Lazarus. There we go. No, I was about to say the, 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 the rich man. Yeah, this, this is, the rich man. what's his name, Lazarus? Though? No, Lazarus was the one that was, uh, poor. Oh, well, this is the, this is the rich man that, that ended up dying because he, uh, he wouldn't give money to Lazarus, right? He wouldn't yeah. uh, feed Lazarus, yeah. right? So this is the rich man speaking to uh, Abraham, right? So the rich man talking to Abraham, he's like, nah, that don't make no sense. Why would I just let him have the Old Testament? 
This Abraham's advice is not. They, just let them hear the Old Testament. They'll be all right. He, he's trying to let them know. If they listen to the Old Testament, they'll be all right. Right? He's like, no. You know what I'm saying? Let's hear. Let's hear what he said. Why he disagree with this? Nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And that's how we think, right? Man, if Jesus just showed himself. I mean, Jesus just, we used to pray. Jesus, just show yourself to me. I just show yourself. Cause I, I, I can believe that way. If you just show yourself to me. Father Abraham said, trust me. Give them the Old Testament. Just give them the Old Testament. They'll be all right. They'll make it. He like, no. Nah. Listen, if somebody just came back from the dead, then they'll believe. Keep going. Watch this. And he said unto them, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. He said, if they don't listen to the Old Testament, somebody right who rose from the dead can't even convince them. That's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with, we're dealing with a book that is so powerful that even a person, even a miracle, can't fully convince you. So that's why a Christian would rather hold on to the belief that no matter what they do, it's okay. No matter what they do, God loves them, right? Because the book itself can't convince them of it. So they convince themselves of a lie, right? And they continue on in it, and they walk in it. And the reason why, because they don't have the structure of the scriptures to correct their misunderstanding of the New Testament. It's all foundational. It's like trying to jump into like a, a, a 102 or a 103 class before taking a 101. You know what I'm saying? It's like trying to jump into high school before going to elementary or middle school. Because now you're going into high school, they're going to introduce information to you with the expectation, well, you already learned basic arithmetic. So now when I'm showing you this algebra, you know what I'm talking about, right? I, we, we got somewhere to build. If you don't know, then you're just going to be looking at it like, I don't have English until next period. Why are y'all showing me letters? I don't get it. Numbers and letters together, what is this? All right, is that in preschool? Right, what are we looking at? And you misunderstand the information. And if you don't have a teacher or somebody who tell you just said, you said a kid who skipped all the elementary, all the, all the middle school, and just set them down in front of the book, the textbook. An algebra textbook. What do you think they're going to come away with? Nothing. they just going to have to try to make sense of whatever's there. And they're going to make a fool out of themselves. That's where we are. right? We've tried to make sense of whatever's there because we haven't had teachers. And at the same time as trying to make sense, we ignored the advice of the book of learning the Old Testament, understanding the Old Testament, and hearing it. So that puts us in a position where we're at a disadvantage. You can tell us or you can tell us darn anything. And the only thing we want to know is does it agree with my spirit? I mean, what, what you say just don't don't agree with my spirit. Right? What does that mean? What does that mean? All that means, well, I don't want to do it. I like what you said or I don't like what you said. I mean, but that's what it comes down to. Our standard has to be based off a book, something that's in right. It can't be based off our darn feelings. That don't make no darn sense. Right? We have to be able to, Moses, how are you going to throw away Moses? They don't, yeah, a lot of people just don't really don't understand how important Moses is. Yahushua himself would tell you, he is like, man, if you believe Moses, you'll believe me. <laughs> Yahushua himself tell you that. They count Moses as if he nothing. They count him like he against Yahushua, like Moses gave you the law and that brought death. But, but Jesus, let me tell you something, Jesus, he brings life. Like they against each other. You know what I'm saying? Like one can go without the other. When, when, when we make it into the kingdom, we reading this stuff in Revelation, when we make it into the kingdom, who you think going to be on the poster boards? <laughs> you think Moses is going to have, you know what I'm saying, no, oh, man, I just tried. You know, I tried to do the best I could. You ain't lost your dog. Grab, um, grab Revelation for him. Grab Revelation, uh, what, 15, 16? That's good. Grab Revelation, uh, Revelation 15, verse 1. This is Revelation chapter 15, verse 1. And I know, and I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Notice, notice that a lot of these, it start off with, and I saw another sign, or I, and I saw a sign in heaven. We going to, as we get, probably not this week, but as we get deeper into the revelations, you'll see that that marks. So revelation is not in order. It's a lot of stuff going on, and they, a lot of it overlaps. Um, 
But whenever he starts off with, I saw a sign in heaven, it kind of resets. Like, this is a new vision. So you was, you was reading for a couple chapters one vision, and maybe you had the seals, or maybe you had the vision of the dragons and the beasts. But once he says, and I saw, I saw a sign in heaven, it starts a new vision that he saw. So these are multiple. It's a series of multiple visions that he's seen, and a lot of them are overlapping in time. So that's why it seemed like we're jumping around in Revelation, because we're trying to keep everything for the most part, in, in somewhat of a, a order, um, that way we can kind of picture it and kind of see it as much as we can see, as much as the Most High God has revealed to us at this moment, you know, what we can see in the book. So, he saw another vision. Great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues up the wrath of God. Oh, we're going to talk about this anyway, right? So, he said seven angels who had the seven last plagues. So, remember that. We'll try to come back to it. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. It's not the third. It's, I don't know. I don't know what number it is. It's not third, though. It's like one, two, three, four, maybe like fifth, six, maybe. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, the glass having the harps of God. Uh-huh. And they sing the song of Moses, the Who's servant a, who, of God. Whose song did they sing? The song of Moses. Why in the world are people in heaven, are angels, heavenly bodies in heaven, singing the darn song of Moses? Who else song did they sing? The servant of God and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy two works. Songs, two songs were sung. Out of all two. That's right. Out of all the songs that were sung, it was Moses and Yahushua. And y'all think y'all can count Moses as nothing? That's crazy. That's crazy. The whole book trying to tell us Moses the darn man. Y'all got it messed up. And we sitting here and we like, nah, Moses just brought death. Moses just brought death. You brought death by disobeying the law. He showed you where your sin is. He brought the righteous know. thing to us. He brought know. us the opportunity to build. Wouldn't know what right and wrong was if it weren't for Moses. You know what I'm saying? He laid the foundation. Y'all sure came and finessed that thing. You know what I'm saying? That's how we got to do it. You got to understand the importance of what God set up. You think he chose a man like Moses just to be choosing him? Why oh, you set Moses up? Ha ha, everybody going to hate you now. Man, y'all crazy the way, the way they imagine this stuff. It's just crazy. You got the whole book telling you, you still using your imagination for some wildness. You don't use your imagination. Use it for what the book says. Stuff that's crazy. Keep going. Let's see. Let's finish this out. Let's talk about the seven plays. We'll just get right to it. So let's go. This uh, what verse? Three. It's verse three. It's Revelation chapter fifteen, verse three. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, uh -huh. and the song of the Lamb, saying, "Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, thou King of saints." What that tell you right there? They sing the Old Testament and the New Testament. Just right there, they they talking about the man who brought the first covenant, the old covenant, and they talking about the man who brought the new covenant. That's the only two people they talking about. Cause it's a whole book. You try to separate it, you gonna make a mess. What you gonna do? How you gonna separate it? You're gonna make a mess each time. All right, keep going. Let's hear it. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art, for thou I'm only tell art something holy. else about Moses too. We we gonna work tonight. Come on, let's keep going. For thy judgment are made, wait, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art, for thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. That's right. And the seven angels temple, having the seven plagues. The seven clothed, angels came out having what? The seven plagues. Uh-oh. Clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. Look at that. And one of the four, and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven vials, the wrath of God. So a vial is like a bowl. Ever. You know what I'm saying? So they gave them they gave it like seven seven bowls and the bowls are full of the wrath of God. And so what they do with them? Excuse me. Seven golden ain't the seven angels, seven golden vials of the wrath of God who live forever and ever. And the temple was filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Right. So the goal was to lay out all these plagues. Right. Each bowl 
they called it, they called them vials. So each vial or bowl, you know what I'm saying, was full of God's wrath. Each one has a different plague in it. You know what I'm saying? So you got 70 things with seven angels. So one angel has one each. You know what I'm saying? And they just want to pour it out one at a time on the world, and it's going to come with a, its own consequence, right? Because they have seven plagues, much like when we were in Egypt, right? When we were in Egypt, it was the same, same type of deal. Moses came along. Moses was like, listen, let us go. Matter of fact, let's grab it. This, uh, he, this is, uh, I'm about to say Hebrews. Uh, this is uh, Exodus chapter 8. Let me grab it real quick. It's Exodus chapter 8. Uh, give me Exodus chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9, verse 8. And the Lord said unto Moses and unto Aaron, Take to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh. All right, so he told him, take, take uh, handfuls of the ashes, right? So you take them ashes. And he said, sprinkle them towards it in the sky, right? Throw them in the air. Keep going. And it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil breaking forth with blands and, and upon beasts throughout all the land of Egypt. All right? So then, when this stuff hit these people's skin, so he just takes some ash and throw it in the sky, and it turns into, you know, this stuff that turns into boils on your skin. All right? So this was, the, this was the, one of the plagues. Right, hit their skin, and boils break out on their darn skin. Watch this. Keep going. And they took the ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh and Moses, sprinkled it up toward heaven. Uh huh. And it became a boil breaking forth with blands upon man and upon beast. Uh huh. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians, the Egyptians. Mm hmm. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them. As the Lord has spoken unto Moses. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before so Pharaoh. Pharaoh didn't, Pharaoh didn't move because that he is like, he boy, he like, man, I ain't messing with y'all. He still didn't let us go. Right? So look at what happened next. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, let he said, my people go. Thus said the Lord God of who? The Hebrews. And what was the goal? Let my people go that they may serve me. So why do you think the plague's hitting the. Uh, why do you think the plague was hidden? So that our people can be let go. Why do you think the plague going to get hit again? So our, so our people, people can be let go. Same thing. Same game plan that we're looking at. We're going to paint this whole picture. You're going gonna to see the whole picture going to line up. All of it going to make sense, too. Because you have seven plagues that's going to happen in the end. It's not just a seven plague because you still got seven tip, uh, trumpets. And you also, we're going to come back to the seven trumpets because that's where we left off last week. You know what I'm saying? So you still got seven trumpets and you got seven seals. We haven't read all the seven seals, but we kind of jumped over some of them, right? So you got seven seals, seven trumpets, and you have seven plagues. Some of it is overlapping, though. You know what I'm saying? Like the seven plagues and the seven trumpets are almost exactly the same. You know what I'm saying? If you look at them, in the order that they go in, they're almost exactly the same. So we'll kind of we'll look at that also. You know what I'm saying? But you see, he's the goal for Moses was to get the people out. And that's what God commanded. He said, tell them, let my people go. The God of the Hebrews. Not the God of the world. Not the God of all people. The God of the Hebrews is how he introduced himself. Not saying he's not the God of all people. I'm saying he chose to introduce himself as the God of the Hebrews. That's important for us. All right? Because he wanted to rescue our people. All right? He wanted to cause us to escape. When he did it, he asked Pharaoh to let us go. He didn't say, hey, you have to let us go. He didn't say, I'm going to strike you down right now if you don't let us go. He said, all right, I'm going to hit you with plagues. Pharaoh lived through the whole thing, right? He was able to live, live until we walked out, right? And the Most High God, he had to tell us, okay, you can go. Because he broke them down with the plagues, right? No different from what we're going to see in the end. These people are going to be broke down with the plagues, and they're going to get our butt up out of there. All right, let's go back. This is uh, Revelation chapter 16. We finished chapter 15. We're going to go to chapter 16, verse 1. Let's hear about these seven plagues. <laughs> and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. All right, so these are the bowls, and they're going to have the, the wrath of God on them, right? Keep going. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome 
and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. Right? So the people who, who sinned towards the Most High God and had the mark of the beast and uh, worshipped the image of the beast. And we talked about the image of the beast before. Right? We talked about all that stuff. So if you... If you had the mark and you uh you had the and you worship the image and or you worship the image, then you got hit with with sores. That sounds a lot like boils, don't it? Mm -hmm. All right? We look at the plagues. We're gonna go through some of these plagues. You gonna see a lot of these things is similar to what happened when Moses was uh trying to get us free. All right? So what I, what else happened? Let's see. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of dead men. Of uh oh. Dead men. What and, else? And every living soul died in the sea. Uh oh. Keep going. And the third angel poured out his upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. Everything becoming darn blood, right? That don't sound familiar at all. That's the famous one, right? You got more. Grab uh, Exodus chapter four. This is Exodus chapter four. We gonna hold. We got. We gonna come on back. It's important that we understand this, though. When we look at it. How are you going to try to understand what's happening in Revelation if you don't know the history? If you don't know the scripture, if you don't know what Moses taught, if you don't know what Moses did, it doesn't make any sense. You're just looking at darn plagues happening. You don't know what to expect. The book, the way Revelation is written, you're supposed to look at it and be like, oh, I remember that. Right? I remember that. I remember that. I read that before. Where did I read that at? Then you should be able to go back and get more context and, and set of expectations. Right? Let's look at it. This is Exodus chapter 4, verse 8. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice this of... This is the Most High God talking to Moses. He said, man, it shall come to pass, if the people don't believe you, and they don't hearken onto your, uh, onto your voice from the... Uh, He's going to tell them from the sign. Go ahead. And if they don't hearken to the voice of the first sign, to your voice of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. Mm -hmm. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice, that you shall take then oh wait, that you that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land. And the water which you take out of the river shall become blood upon dry land. Alright? He said, You do this, water gonna end up being blood. So when it came down to it and he had to talk to Pharaoh, jump over to uh, verse seven. Or chapter seven, sorry. Number chapter seven. So when it came down to it, and he had to, he had to tell Pharaoh, "Yo, let us go." In verse fourteen, watch what he say. Watch how it play out. It's amazing we look in Revelation, then the water turned to blood. They put out, you know, what I'm saying, you put out the second and the third uh, uh, bowl of God's wrath, and all of a sudden, water start turning into blood. The seas start turning into blood, then the rivers and the fountains start turning into blood. Watch what happened here. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He, mm -hmm. he refused to let the people go. Mm -hmm. Get thee unto Pharaoh in the morning. Lo, he goes out into the water, and you shall go by the river banks, river's bank against he come. Mm -hmm. And the rod which is turned to a serpent shall thou take in thine hand. And thou shalt say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews has sent me, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. And behold, let the Hebrews go now. Yeah, that we can that serve them in the hit. wilderness. Keep all that in mind so that we can serve them in the wilderness. All this is providing context for what we're about to read in Revelation. Keep going. That thou wouldest not, um, they may serve me in the wilderness, and behold, from here, here too thou wouldest, wouldest not hear. Mm -hmm. Thus says the Lord, thus saith the Lord, in this thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will smite with the rod that is in my hand upon the waters which are in the river, and they shall be turned to blood. Mm -hmm. And the fish that is in the river shall die, and the river shall stink, and the Egyptians shall loathe to drink of the water of the river. Mm -hmm. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Take thy rod, and stretch out thy hand upon the waters of Egypt, upon their streams, upon their rivers, and upon their ponds, and upon all their pools of water, that they may become blood, that there may be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. All the water became that was a plague. And the purpose of the plague was to let our people go. And guess who did it? Moses. Right? Let me show y'all something. Go to Revelation chapter 11. We're going to come back to 16. This is Revelation chapter 11. This is Revelation chapter 11. Give me 
me verse, uh, go ahead and give me verse 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple right, of go God. Go ahead and give me verse 3. We're going to talk, talk about that too, but we're going to have to get to that later. You know what I'm saying? That's, I doubt if we're going to get to that this week. So give me verse 3. This is Revelation chapter 11, verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. All right? So he said, this is, this is, this is a vision that he's seen. He says, it's going to be two witnesses that he gives power to. And they're going to have a set amount of time that they have this power, right? Let's hear about these two witnesses. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Right? Because, I mean, if you think about it, if you have, if, if I mean, we, if, if what I'm saying is right, right, you have Exodus, right, that describes Moses the, by the hand of God delivering us from bondage in Egypt, right? We had a prophet who brought us out of that time, right? It was a prophet and he led us out. So then if we are to say that it's going to be the same in terms of what's being described in Revelation, that these plagues come and that this is to get let the people go, right? If that's to be true, then we would expect to have a prophet, right? So this is telling us in, in Revelation, same book, in Revelation chapter 11, is letting us know that he said he has two prophets, right? And he's going to give them a, a, a power for a certain amount of time. Then he called them. What, what was that next verse? What's verse four? Look These what are the two them. olive trees. These are the two olive trees. And the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. There's no way that you would know what any of this is talking about if you don't know the scripture. Just like Father Abraham told us. He said, let them hear Moses and the prophets. If you don't understand Moses and the prophets, there's no way you'll know what he's talking about when he's telling you. These are the two olive trees. What two olive trees? What are you talking about? What do two olive trees have to do with anything? Let's figure it out. This is Zechariah chapter 4. Let's figure out the two olive trees. It's important that we get it. Once we piece together all this information, then when we read it, it's clear. A lot of it at least. Not all of it, but a lot of it is clear. You know what he's trying to communicate. Is Zechariah chapter 4. We're going to start at verse 1. This is Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. And the angel that talked with me came again and walked me as a man that is waking, oh, and waked me as a man that is waking out of his sleep. All right? So this is Zechariah seeing a vision. All right? All these are visions that we're looking at, but this one in the scripture, it's not revelation. This one in the scripture, it's been there. All right? It's the stuff that these people ignore. It's stuff that these people don't care about. When it's in revelation, they're like, ooh. All right? When they're talking about it in the scripture, they act like, oh, no, that don't matter. That's already done. Jesus came. Okay. Let's hear about it. And said unto me, What seest thou? Mm -hmm. And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick of all gold. A what? A candlestick all of gold. And what's in front of this thing? With a bowl upon the top of it. A what on the top of it? A bowl upon the top of it. We're just talking about vows. Okay, let's see. And his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps which were upon the top thereof. Okay, and what else? And two olive trees by it. And two what? Olive trees by it. So now we know a revelation to these are the two olive trees this is what it's referring to so he says two olive trees by him what else one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side thereof okay so i answered and spake to the angel that talked with me saying what are these my lord uh-huh then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me knowest thou not what these be right so the angel he is like oh you don't know what these be now, after you see something like that, you expect an angel. Well, let me explain it to you what it is. Let's see what happened next. Let's see what the next verse talking about. Then the angel that talked with me answered and said, Knowest thou not what these be? Right. And so I he said, said, Don't you know? Don't you know what these two olive trees are? 
And I said, No, my Lord. Uh huh. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, That's it. He kept it moving. He gave him a whole other prophecy. He asked, he is like, So what are these? The angel was like, You don't know what these are? He is like, No. Nah. He is like, Oh, well, let me tell you what I got to say to Zerubbabel. Right? We're going to come back to what he said to Zerubbabel because that's all going to tie in also. Right? But it doesn't tie into the olive trees directly. That was the question that he had. He didn't answer his question. But the question is somewhat answered throughout the rest of the scripture. Right? Let's grab, let's grab, uh, let's grab, huh? He's in Ezekiel. What's in Ezekiel? Uh, the, I think that's the two sticks in my hand. Oh, the two sticks? Yeah. yeah, let's grab uh, Mark chapter 9. It's Mark chapter 9, verse 1. We're going to let Yahushua tell us. All right? Because you remember, you had a candlestick that had a bowl on the top, right? A vial, that's what a vial is. A vial is a bowl, same thing, right? So it's a candlestick that had a bowl on the top, right? And then with this bowl on the top, what you looking at, boy? With this bowl on the top, you got two olive trees, one on the right, one on the left. That's how the book describes it. Then we go back to Revelation. Revelation tells us, yeah, there's two olive trees. He said, I got two witnesses. And he tells us, these witnesses are the two olive trees. So now we like, okay, we know that they're the two olive trees that Zechariah was talking about. But who was Zechariah talking about? Because when we look at it, he asked them. What are these? And he's like, man, you don't know what these are? Oh, all right. And then kept it pushing and didn't never explained it. So we're going to see if anybody's going to explain this to us. This is Yahushua. He's speaking. Mark chapter 9, verse 1. Verily I say unto you that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. All right. He said, y'all not going to taste of death until you've seen the kingdom of God come with power. All right. Let's see. And after six days, Yahushua takes with him Peter and James and John and leads them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. Mm -hmm. And he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. Mm -hmm. And there appeared unto them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Yahushua. Elijah with Moses. You got two people standing in front of Yahushua. One's name was Elijah. The other's name was Moses. Two people. It's supposed to be two witnesses. I don't know why these two were chosen to speak to Yahushua. Why they, what they got? Why, why they got to talk to Yahushua? And this is a vision that Yahushua just told them. Y'all seeing the kingdom of God come in power, and it just so happens when the kingdom of God is coming in power, you see Elijah and you see Moses. When we talking about what we talking about in Revelation. You know what that is? That's the kingdom of God coming in power. Right? And then there's supposed to be two witnesses with him. Yet here we see Moses and Elijah. Let's see if we can put it all together. Let's keep going. And Peter answered and said to Yahushua, Master, it is good for us to be here. Uh huh. Let us make let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Uh-huh. For he did not under for he didn't know what to say, wist not what to say. Mm-hmm. But they were sore afraid, and there was a cloud that overshadowed them. Uh huh. And a voice came out of the cloud, saying, "This is my beloved son. Hear him." Uh huh. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man anymore except Yahushua only with themselves. All right. So Moses and Elijah they disappeared. Mm hmm. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. I and wonder they, why they had to do that. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one another what the rising from the dead should mean. Mm-hmm. And they asked him, saying, why say the scribes that Elijah must come first? So notice what they're saying, right? They saw Elijah just now. And they knew it was Elijah, right? But who else was supposed to be Elijah? Who else was supposed to be Elijah? No, not Yahushua. Uh, Who came before Yahushua came? Moses. Huh? John the Baptist. Good. That's right. 
All right, so John the Baptist came, and the first thing that Yahushua said about him said, he comes in the spirit of Elijah. Right? So you can imagine the disciples after hearing him saying that, they like, I don't get it. I thought Elijah was supposed to come first. Because they're looking at it like, this thing about to go down. So I thought Elijah was supposed to come first. Notice what Yahushua, how he answers this question. And he answered and told them, Elijah verily comes first. He said, Elijah for sure comes first. No doubt about it. Right? Elijah will for sure come first. Let's hear about it. And what are you going to do when he comes? And restore all things. Oh, I wonder what that means. Elijah is going to surely come first. And Elijah is going to restore all things. What needs to be restored? The king. Our people. Our inheritance. He, could, he said he's going to restore all things. If you look at them now, nothing needs to be restored, right? We got, I mean, we got, I mean, the only thing I guess that needs to be restored is our dominance, right? The kingdom, right? He says all things will be restored when Elijah comes. He said Elijah will verily for sure he coming and he going to restore all things. Watch this. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at naught. Now, he's telling you Elijah is going to come first, right? They tell him, I thought Elijah had to come first. They're like, yeah, Elijah is going to come first. Now watch what he say again. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be set at nothing. Uh huh. But I say unto you that Elijah is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him. So first he talks future. Elijah will verily come first. He's definitely coming. He's coming first. Then he goes past. He said, yeah, Elijah already came, and they did with him what they wanted to. Right? He's telling you that with his, with his coming, his first coming, Yahushua's first coming, Elijah had to come first, right, in the form of John the Baptist to pave the way for him, right? And then when he comes back and he returns to restore the kingdom, Elijah still has to come first. So there's going to be Elijah coming in the end times as well. Right? And that's exactly what the book tells us. Right? If we grab uh, Malachi chapter 4. Right? Because we know John the Baptist definitely came in the spirit of Elijah. Most High God said that through his son. Easily. There's no dispute. That's why Yahushua answered that question twice. He's like, oh, he barely comes. Let's make no, make no mistake. He definitely going to come first. Right? Then at the end of it, it's like, and he already came. You know what I'm saying? They did with him what they wanted. Chopped off the man's head. Right? Watch what Malachi got to say about it, though. This is where everybody get it. He asked that question. I thought Elijah came first. This is why he thought Elijah came first. This is Malachi chapter 4. For behold, the day comes that shall burn as another, and all the proud, day, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. Jump on down. Uh, give me uh, chapter 4, verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant. Remember who? The law of Moses, my servant. So how are we going to throw the law away? And we sitting there, I mean, the law done away with, and the man telling us, Most High God telling us, Remember ye the law of who? Moses. My servant. He said, you got to remember the work of Moses. Then after that, who, who, what, what's going to happen? Which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgment. Uh huh. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming in the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he he shall, said, he going to send who? Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Before, okay, so this is very important. Remember last week we talked about, yeah, we saw the sun turn to blood. Hey, get her away from him. Right? He said... He said, the sun turned to blood. And after that, that means that was before the day of the Lord, right? We saw it in the text last week. It said, before the day of the Lord, the sun will turn to blood. So it's important that we understand what it tells us when, right? When is it going to happen? He said he's going to send Elijah. When? I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So Elijah also comes before the day of the Lord. We're going to learn that Yahushua comes on the day of the Lord. 
right? That's going to be it. Like, he comes on that very day, right? So Elijah's going to come before. And before he told you about Elijah, he also told you to remember the law and my servant Moses. So here goes those same two people, right? The same two people that we saw standing with Yahushua. Now, we know we got two witnesses that's coming in the end, right? And this just happens to be the same two people that the prophets told us to remember, all right? And then those same two people showed up in the New Testament in front of Yahushua, right? Very important that we look at that. And then remember, Yahushua told them that he's going to restore all things, right? Watch what this say next. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. And the heart of the children to their fathers. And the heart of the children to their fathers. Right? So he said he's going to turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. All right? Keep going. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Right? And lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. All right? Most High God looking to curse the earth. He said, first, let me make sure that Elijah turns the heart of the fathers to the children and the children to the father. Let me make sure all things are restored. Right? That wouldn't necessarily make sense unless we know the scripture. Right? We have to know the scripture. What would have to be restored? Well, let's see what the Most High God set up for us. Let's go through a little bit of history. We're just going to take some snapshots. This is Exodus chapter 6. This is what the Most High God told Moses. Remember, a lot of things was promised to Abraham. Then they were promised to Isaac. Then they were promised to Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Jacob made promises to his 12 sons. Out of those 12 sons came Levi, right? One of those 12 sons was Levi. Out of Levi eventually came Moses. We went into captivity. Moses then, by the hand of the Most High God, delivered us from that captivity, right? So this is Exodus chapter 6, verse 6. And let's see what Moses was told. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Uh -huh. And I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with stretched out arm and with great judgment. Mm -hmm. And I will make you be for a people, and I will be your God, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So he said, I will make you to me for a people, and I will bring you out of the Egyptians. Keep going. And I will bring you into the land concerning which I did swear to give it to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. And this I will give important. it to you for a heritage. I am the Lord. He said, I'm going to bring you into a land, right? And this is the land that I promised to your fathers, right? And then I'm going to give it to you for a what? For a heritage. Very important to remember that word. He said, I'm going to give it to you for a heritage, right? Let's jump over to Joshua because now we saw that's where the promise was made. But I want to see when it was fulfilled, right? So you see Joshua. This is Joshua at the end. Give me verse uh, chapter 19, verse 49. So it's like close to the end of the chapter. It's Joshua chapter 19, verse It's Joshua chapter 19, verse 49. They have made an end of dividing the land for inheritance by their For what? Coast, for inheritance. So he gave it to us for a heritage. Then all of a sudden, by their coast. now we're dividing the land for an inheritance. Right? Because that's how he gave it to us. Now watch this. This is what Joshua had to do. He had to divide the land for the people, right? Remember, Jacob had 12 sons, right? One of his sons' name was Joseph. Joseph had two sons. Then Jacob took on his two sons as if they were his, right? And then Levi was removed from having a part of the inheritance that was given by God. God was made Levi's inheritance. 
So we had to divide our land into 12 parts. We had a half of a tribe of Manasseh, and we had Gad, and we had the Reubenites who lived on the eastern part of Israel, right? Then you had the rest of the tribes, the other half of uh, Manasseh, and the rest of the tribes who lived on the other, the western end of uh, Israel. And so all the land got divided in that, in, that, in that fashion. So once we divided it through all the tribes, and we don't have to read them all, but the book goes through every single one of the tribes, and it goes and divides the land, and it gives it to them, and all that good stuff. Everybody get their territory, or what they were supposed to get. You know what I'm saying? Some people didn't fight for theirs, but you know, that's a whole other story. You know what I'm saying? So everybody was supposed to get their territory. All right? Let's look at it. This is uh, Joshua chapter 19, verse 49. When they had made an end of dividing the land for inheritance by their coast, the children of Israel gave an inheritance to Joshua, the son of Nun, among them. Mm -hmm. According to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city which he asked, even Timnath Seria, mm -hmm. in Mount Ephraim, built the city and dwelt therein. Mm -hmm. These are the inheritances which Eliezer the priest and Joshua, the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel. The heads of the who? The heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel. Divided for an inheritance by Lot and Shiloh before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So they made an end of, divide, of dividing the country. All right. So they divided the whole country. They did it because it was their inheritance. And they did it by the fathers. Right. They did it by the fathers. Right. So now let's look at Jeremiah. Right. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 4. All right. Because now we have to fast forward. After Joshua, we did a whole lot of sinning. Did a whole lot of stuff we wasn't supposed to do. All the stuff that Most High God told us not to do. We did it. Most High God gave us, he, he, he told us in our law to curse. If we don't do it, he told us what would happen to us. So now, at the time that the Most High God is about to make some of this stuff happen, he sent us prophets to warn us about some of these things. And watch one of the warnings that came out. This is Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 4. It's important that we know our history. We don't know our history. We're trying to read Revelation. We most I gotta make a fool out of us, right? It's Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 4. Watch what he said. And thou, even thyself, shall discontinue from thine inheritance. He said, They will discontinue from their inheritance or from their heritage. Yeah. Right? Keep going. That I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve thy enemies in the land which you know not. Right? The prophecy was. That you're going to lose your heritage. We just learned what our heritage was. Our heritage was he was going to give us a land. The only way we have that land is if we know what part of the land it was divided to one of our fathers. So let's just say you don't have a father. How are you going to get some land in there? You're not. You got to have your father to know which part of the land you're going to get to. Right? And that was the heritage. He said you're going to discontinue from your heritage. Keep going. That I gave thee, and I will cause thee to serve your enemies in the land which you know not. Oh, that make a whole lot of sense because we in America, right? We have our fathers who served their enemies in a land which they had no idea about, right? And it's not just America, it's just a different place in the world. A lot of these places we had no idea about, and they took us to these lands, and we served our enemies, Right? And we discontinue from our heritage because if I ask a black person, I'd be like, well, where you come from? Africa. Africa is a whole continent. You came from Africa, that's true. That's a whole continent. I mean, like, where you come from? Like, what's your history? What people you come from? Well, you don't know, some people say we Egyptians. Other people say we Zulu. You know what I'm saying? They get, and they just start throwing stuff. I mean, I'm Nigerian, this, that, and other. It's like, okay, yeah, you might you might have came from Nigeria for sure, but I mean, what people? What's your custom? You know what I'm saying? What do y'all do? You know what I'm saying? What's your history? Tell us about some of this stuff. They won't know because they've been removed. They've discontinued from their heritage. That's the book. The book told us this would happen. So now when, when Elijah has to come along and he has to restore all things, that's why you see Malachi telling us he's going to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the sons in the hearts of the sons back to the fathers because the fathers Abraham Isaac Jacob right the sons of Jacob all of the 12 sons of the Jacob those are all our fathers so when our hearts are turned back to him we say 
Oh, I'm the tribe of Issachar. Oh, I'm the tribe of Dan. Oh, I'm the tribe of Naphtali. Right? Our hearts are turned back to our fathers. Then we're connected back to our heritage. Then we have rights back to the land. And the whole purpose is to get us back to the land. You'll see. This is a this is a this is a Revelation chapter seven. This would make more sense. People see this in Revelation, like I don't, I don't really understand why this is happening or how this is happening. I'm gonna show you how it's gonna happen. Revelation chapter seven, verse one. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, uh -huh. that the wind should not blow upon the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Mm -hmm. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice unto the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and, to, and the sea, uh -huh. saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God their foreheads. Right? He said, We got to seal them first. And watch how, watch how they choose the people out that they're going to seal. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. He said, All the what? Tribes of the children of Israel. So how in the world can, I mean, right now, if we stop, we say, I want to find somebody from Ephraim. Who do I go looking for? These people don't know. Right? They don't, they don't know. They can't tell you who the tribe of Ephraim is. They can't tell you who the tribe of Issachar is. Right? They don't know none of the tribes. So now watch this. It says it's going to steal somebody. It's going to steal people 144 from all the tribes of Israel. Every one of them. This is all the tribes of Israel is 144 of them, right? Or 144,000, rather. Right? So 144,000 of all the tribes of Israel. Watch how this thing play out. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed 12,000. How we know who Judah is? Unless Elijah come back and he restore all things. He turned the hearts of the fathers back to the sons. And the hearts of the sons back to the fathers. Elijah let us know, yeah, that's your tribe. That was your father. And he starts to separate us. He starts to put us back into our tribe and let us know where we're going. Right? Keep going. Of the tribe of Reuben were still 12,000. Oh, so how we know who Reuben is? Keep going. Of the tribe of Gad were still 12,000. I have no idea who we, how we know who Gad is. Right? Keep going. Of the tribe of Asher were still 12,000. Mm hmm. Of the tribe of Naphtali were sealed 12,000. Mm -hmm. Of the tribe of Manasseh were sealed 12,000. Mm -hmm. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed 12,000. Yep. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000. Uh-huh. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000. Yep. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000. Uh-huh. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Uh-huh. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. Uh-huh. So we look at these things. And they lay it out. They say, well, there's 12,000 from this tribe, 12,000 from that tribe. And they lay out all our tribes. And so now we want to understand how, right? But maybe Elijah going to come and he's going to restore all things. He's going to put things back in proper order, right? What we read before, we don't have time to get into it tonight, but what we read before in uh, chapter 11, Revelation chapter 11, it started off talking about a man with a reed sealing off the temple. We're going to start talking about that. We're going to go to Ezekiel, and we're going to see how a man with a reed, he take measurements of a temple, and a temple was built. I mean, if you're going to restore all things, we're going to have to have a temple, right? And we're going to have a temple built. And, you know, a lot of people are like, man, so after Jesus come back, that's when that temple get built. But then you look at it, and it tell you about a priest. And you know what the priests have? A wife. So how is a priest going to have a wife when Yahushua told us in the coming age you won't marry nor be given into marriage? That's a conflict at that point, right? So we have to be able to look at it. If Elijah, who comes before the great notable day of the Lord, restores all things and turns the hearts of the Father back to the Son, that means the temple going to have to be put up before Yahushua come. That way when Yahushua touch down, everything's still in play. Prophecy tells us another thing that we not gonna build it. 
They said these Gentiles going to build it. Or at least help. Right? A lot of this stuff we're going to look into. We're not going to look into it tonight. We're going to stay on track. So this is a, this is a Revelation. Where are we at? Where, Revelation 7 there? Mm-hmm. This is Revelation chapter 11. Let's try to finish it out. Right? Because technically we still want Shua. I mean, we got Moses and we got Elijah. They were standing in front of Yahushua. We know there's two witnesses. Zechariah told us about two um, olive trees. Revelation told us about two olive trees. Now we're kind of assuming maybe that these two olive trees might be Moses and Elijah just because those are the two people that were standing in front of Yahushua when he said the kingdom is going to come in power, right? It's still quite a bit of a jump. Is that enough evidence to make it solid? I don't know. Let's look and see what else we got. So this is a Revelation chapter 11, verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Okay. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this matter be killed. Right? So he's about to tell you how the man going to be killed who hurts him. What's going to happen to the man that hurt them? The fire doesn't come out of them. Nah, he's going to tell you right now. Power to shut up, to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. So hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. These have power to do what now? To shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And what else can they do? And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So tell me that don't sound familiar. Whole time you read Revelation, you know what you should be saying to yourself? I remember that. Whole time. You should be like, I remember that. If you look at it, he said they have the power to shut up heaven so it rains not. During what? The days of their prophecy. How many days of their prophecy? 1,000. It's there? Three score days. That was right, by the way. I think it's like verse 3. 1,203 score days. All right, so let's see. 1,200. 1,260 days, right? They say they got the power to shut up the rain for the days of their prophecy. The prophecy already told us that they're going to have, I mean, uh, the, the vision already told us that they're going to have their power for 1,260 days. So for 1,260 days, they can shut the rain off, right? Now, what I want to understand is who, who do we know that shut the rain. I mean, because we know somebody who can turn water in the, in the blood. You know what I'm saying? We just read about that. That thing clear. So we know that's Moses all day. Who had that power at least? You know what I'm saying? He'd done that before. The most I got is let him do that before. Right? But who can shut up the rain? Let's Elijah. see. Elijah, absolutely. Let's see. This is, uh, this is 1 Kings 17, verse 1. Only thing I can do is show you what's in the book. It's First Kings seventeen, verse one. It's a whole lot of stuff I can't put together. Like we get that when we talk about mystery Babylon, when we talk about uh, when we talk about uh, the seventh beast. I mean, the seventh head on the beast and all this stuff. I ain't about to sit here and tell y'all, oh, yeah, it was this and it was that. It's the Roman Empire. It's the Ottoman Empire. If I don't know, I ain't going to say it. If I can't prove it out in the book, I might have my theories and all that, but I ain't going to teach that thing as, you know, as the book. You know what I'm saying? That's just me running my darn mouth. You know what I'm saying? I'm tell, I'm, what I'm trying to tell y'all is book. I can show y'all this stuff in the book. If the book prove it out, there ain't no reason to be the, you know what I'm saying, for it to be disputable. We can debate over disputable matter, but this thing ain't disputable if it's in the book. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead. This is 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. He said, Elijah the Tishbite, who was of what? The inhabitants of Gilead said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, for whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. He said, the only way it's going to rain is according to my word. He jumped right on the scene. Shut the all, all the rain. He said, only way, he said, by the word of the most I got, only way it's going to rain is if I say so. Right? He was known for that. It, it's not a private thing. It wasn't no thing that like nobody knew about. He was known. He was famous for it. 
Uh, even James talked about it. Y'all wish you would talk about it. Grab, uh, grab Luke chapter 4. This is Luke chapter 4, verse 25. Watch what y'all should have to say about this. This is Luke chapter 4, verse 5. All right? He jumped right on the scene. He ain't even asked no darn question. He's like, hey, yo, Ahab. Let me just know you. Ahab was the king at the time, right? That was our king Ahab. We don't have our kings up there no more, but Ahab was our king at the time. Ahab was like, you know what I'm saying, running the show. He had a, he had a wife, you know what I'm saying? Her name was Jezebel. Right? So he was running the show. Elijah, he jumped right on the scene. He was like, listen, I'm going to shut this whole thing down. Ain't no rain. So it was a famine in the land after he did that. Right? He said, he said for these years. Watch what y'all sure though. He, he, give us, he give us some more detail. And the devil up into the high mountain. He said, Luke 4. This is Luke chapter 4, verse 25. 25, sorry. But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when was shut up three so years hold on and six months when the heaven was shut up for how long three years and six months uh oh so now we got a hundred uh, uh 1260 days and then we also got three and a half years All right if we pull out a calculator and we say 100 i mean i'm sorry 1260 divided by 30, right, for a month, that's going to hit us with 42, right? That means 42 months. Then if we take the 42 months and divide that by 12 to get years out of it, it's going to give us three and a half, three years, six months, right? Yahushua himself just said, Elijah, shut up the heavens for three years, six months. We go to Revelation 11, it tell us 100, I mean 1,260 days, same thing as three years, six months, he will have this power, and for as long as he has this power, he can shut up the heavens. Ain't that amazing? That book there. That thing book there. What you gonna do with it? Whole thing in the book, right? Whole thing in the book. What are we gonna do, fight against it? It's Revelation 11. Revelation 11, I think we left off at verse 6. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have the power over the waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So this is something, with the time frame even exact, this is something that Elijah is known for, and something that Moses is known for. No other people are known for the things that just got named other than these two people. These happen to be the two people who spoke to Yahushua when he told them that he, they will see the kingdom come in power. We also were talking about two witnesses that were called olive trees and referred to uh, in Zechariah as olive trees. Right? You said, what about Elijah now? He didn't die. Let's hear about somebody dying. So this is, the, this is Revelation 11, verse 6. And let's hear about what happened to these two witnesses after they, they had these powers. Right? Let's hear about it. You remember, he said Elijah didn't die. We got to prove that thing out too. Let's see. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and uh -huh. shall overcome them and kill them. Okay, so they're going to kill them. That yeah. sucks. Let's see. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So where was our master crucified? So how in the world did they get back to Judah? All right, we got to ask that question. It say where our, where our Lord, where our master was crucified. We know that to be Judah. So how, what I want to know is, these witnesses are going to be in our land, Judah. Right? All our people in captivity. So where did he pull these witnesses from? I would propose to you. We're going to be in Judah with these witnesses. All right? Watch what happened next. And they of the people in kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. The only way that all the people are going to see it, that thing going to be blasting on the news. 
Uh, that thing all over the news. They're dead. They're going to be happy about it. Too large. So the book will tell you. Watch this. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice all the, over them and make merry. Look, he told you. They're going to rejoice over it and make merry. They're going to be happy over they, them dying. They shut up the rain for three and a half years? Turning water into blood? We ain't got time for that. Who you think doing these plays? Who do you think doing the play? We, we read about the plagues, right? The seven plagues. We started to read some of them. And we heard, read two of them turn the water into blood. Who do you, you think was running this? Who do you think making the plagues happen? Who do you think going to be, just like, just like when we were reading the Exodus, he told Moses to tell Aaron to drop his, you know, to, to, to drop the stick and it turned into a snake. He, uh, to a, uh, I'm hungry. He turned into a snake, right? He tell Moses to throw some uh, dirt in the air. So Aaron throws some dirt, dirt in the air. What happened? Everybody break out and boil. Right? So when these plagues come and the angels are pouring them out, what figure that people will see and interact with? Who you think Who you think going to be uh, prophesying when this stuff happens? Two witnesses. Going to be two witnesses. Making this stuff happen. Shutting up the rain, turning stuff into water. And we might have missed it, but notice that it didn't just say shutting up the rain and turning stuff into water. Read it. Let's read it one more time because we might have missed one of them. This is, this is 11, uh, Revelation 11, 4. Watch what he said. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Uh-huh. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out of their mouth and devours their enemies. Uh-huh. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Uh-huh. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not. In the so they have power to shut heaven that it rain not. And have power over waters to turn them to blood. And power over waters to turn them to blood. But this is the one that we miss. This is the power that we miss. What else can they do? And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. They can hit that butt with plagues as often as they want to. Who you think making these plagues happen? When we read about them in Revelation, we see these plagues. Who you think making it happen? It's Revelation 11. Most I gave it to them. They say they can do it whenever they want to. That's why, that's why Elijah popped right up on the scene on Ahab. He said it ain't going to happen unless I say so. He didn't say God. He didn't say it ain't going to happen to God. He said it ain't going to happen unless I say so. Most I God already gave it to him. That's you. You got it. Whatever you want to do. That's your judgment. You make it happen. Most I God already gave it to him. Who you think going to be making all these plagues happen? You think the angels just going to be pouring? They even pouring at their commandment. Yeah, you good. Go ahead and let that one loose. Oh, y'all don't want to do Y'all don't want to let us go yet? Go ahead and let another one loose then. Go ahead and break it. Give me vial three. You know what? Run vial three. Go ahead and run that one twice since they ain't listening. Hit me up with vial four now. They say as often as they like. They can do whatever they want to do. Most of God already put it on. Watch what's happening. Let's keep reading. Watch what's going to happen to them. They going, all right, you can jump back down. They died in the streets. Whole world rejoiced. It was that they was on CNN. You know what I'm saying? Fox News covering it. Live covering it. Flying by with a hot helicopter. They laid out in the street. Everybody laughing, happy about it. It's about time these terrorists. You know what I'm saying? These black terrorists. You know what I'm saying? They've been doing this stuff, doing this voodoo, this crazy stuff. They've been plaguing the whole world with their dark magic. These terrorists. All the Christians praising God because these terrorists are died, dead. All the Christians. They all together. They're praising God. Oh, thank the Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, my goodness. This is the beast. That's what Revelation was talking about. They're going to think our prophets, they're going to think that's what Revelation was talking about. That's the first beast, and that's the second beast. That's how they're going to be looking at it. This whole thing going to be backwards. Whole world going to be in one, one focus against our people. And only the people that, got, that don't got the mark is going <clears throat> to be the ones that come to our side and come to our defense. This thing going to be a darn mess. These people ain't going to know what they worshiping. Whole thing going to be darn backwards. They going to be rejoicing because they dead in the street. The only people that can save their darn life. Let's keep watching. Thing going to be blasted all over the news. These people going to make a fool out of themselves. And they have the, the most hard God too. They have the people in kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. Uh huh. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them. And make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Uh -huh. Because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. They sending gifts back and forth. They so happy about that thing. They yeah. said Christmas came early. That was the, that was the Gentiles. 
Christmas came early. They sitting there back and forth, right? He said, hey, okay, we good. Watch what happened. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet. And great fear fell upon them which saw them. Most High God resurrected them after three and a half days. He couldn't make it a flat three because that was just like the sun. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, let me let me wait. You know what I'm saying? After the day passed, then I'll bring you up. Most High God make a fool out of you trying to be like the sun. Even his prophet. You see Lazarus. You remember Lazarus was dead. How long Lazarus was dead? He was dead for a minute. He did four days. Yeah. He said, I ain't about to raise you up in three days. I'll wait four. You know what I'm saying? I ain't about to. What that look like? I'll raise you up three days just so you can be like, well, I got I was risen on the third day too. Most I got to make a fool out of you trying to be like him. Like, nah, we'll wait. We good. Why you think? Well, y'all may not remember, but why you think when uh when Lazarus they told they told y'all was sure. like, man, Lazarus is about to die, right? Most, as a matter of fact, y'all sure already knew. He is like, man, I feel something bad about to happen. Lazarus about to die. It is like, should we head back? He is like, nah, we good. You know what I'm saying? Let's keep working. If he would head back, he'd mess around and get there on the third day. He's like, no, nah, it to take a little time. I need to get another extra day. I'm the only one got to rise on the third day. How's somebody else going to rise on my day? Even then, he's like, yeah, day and a half. You know what I'm saying? I mean, a half a day. We just, just added, added half a day to it, and it'll be all right. So on the third day, half the day passed. Then what happened? Spirit they entered that into upon the earth. Wait. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. Mm -hmm. And they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Uh huh. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up here. Uh huh. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. So they died, they were resurrected, and then they went into heaven. That's interesting for these two people for the very reason that Brother T just said. Elijah didn't die. He never died. Right? Let's read about Elijah real quick before we get out of here. It's 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. Alright? These are two people that died. Alright? And then went up. Died, was resurrected, and then went up into heaven. It's 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Mm -hmm. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire. So a chariot of fire. And horses of fire. Uh-huh. And parted them both asunder. Uh-huh. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So Elijah ended up just going by a whirlwind into heaven. So he saw him. Watch what Elijah say. I mean, Elisha say. And Elisha saw it. My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Uh-huh. And he saw him no more. He, he, he said what? So, I mean, what if he just wanted to have a burial service for him? He said he ain't never, he didn't see him after that. He ain't never seen him after that. Nobody knew where his body was. He just went up in the darn heaven. And guess who has a similar story? Let's talk about Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 5. Moses died. Elijah didn't die. I'm going to show y'all what they got in common, though. It ain't the fact that they didn't die. But Moses did. That's book. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab. Very clear. To the word it's of the a Lord. Moses, servant of the Lord. What happened to him? Died there in the no land dispute there. of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. Let me show you where the dispute comes. And he buried him in the valley of the land of Moab. Who oh. buried him? The Most High. Read that again for me. And he buried him in a Who valley. Who is he? Read. Let's start from the beginning. Because we got to make sure we understand who he is. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. Uh-huh. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor. But so no it couldn't man. be that Moses buried himself. Right? 
So it's telling you the Most High God killed the man and he buried the man. Right? So if the Most High God buried him, let's see if this next verse makes a little sense. But no man knows the sepulcher until this day. Sepulcher is a grave site. Nobody know where his grave is. Most High God buried him. They, they don't know where this man is. So, I mean, if we just wanted to go find, dig up Moses' body, could we find it? No. No. I mean, what if we wanted to go look for Elijah's body? Could we find it? These are two bodies that cannot be found. Most High God handled these bodies. Right? And it just so happens, these two very unique people, right, who have this, this, this similarity, were also in front of Yahushua. When Yahushua said, y'all going to see the coming of the kingdom in power. Right? And it just so happens that there are going to be two witnesses that share some of the same qualities as these same people. And it just so happens that it calls them two olive trees. And it just so happens that the book of Zechariah refers to two olive trees. That stand for before a candlestick. All these things look and link up to show that Moses and Elijah are going to usher us in and in. They're going to lead us to um, come out of captivity and all these different places that we're in. And they're going to navigate us to restore all things. And we're going to have to remember the law just like uh, uh, Zachariah. Mac I mean, Malachi. 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 Just like Malachi told us, we're going to have to remember the law of his servant Moses, and behold, before the great and, and terrible day of the dreadful day of the Lord, he's going to send Elijah, who's going to end up restoring all things. All right? This is the game plan. From here, we look at the plagues. We didn't get to finish them today, but we'll, we'll, we'll look at the plagues. We'll finish out the plagues, and we'll see once we get to the end of the plagues. Um, or throughout the plagues, we, we get our escape, all right? So we'll read about our time in the wilderness, how we go into the wilderness, um, and what that time looks like. We have to spend a little time on that. There's a whole lot there, all right? But uh, what, uh, what that time looks like when we go into the wilderness, escaping captivity, how the Most High God is going to deal with our people, you know what I'm saying? What are going to be the dynamics of that, 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 uh, that, that, uh, that time period. Then... Maybe next week, or maybe we will be we'll have to squeeze it into the next one. Then we'll discuss the uh, the temple that uh, that we'll we'll have built. Um, some of the interesting things about the temple, some of the things we can expect, and then lastly, we'll talk about the gathering of all the nations against us in anger to destroy us and to kill us in the fight against God. And how Yahushua show up at the nick of time. And it goes down. And that is the great and notable day of the Lord. We'll look at it and we'll try to end it off there. Hopefully we can we can finish it off in about, about two more studies. You know what I'm saying? But we'll see. Um, I wanted to try to wrap it up in six. So we'll see. We should be able to. Um, but some of this stuff kind of heavy. So it just depends. But any questions? All right. Well, let's pray out. <laughs>